And good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us at North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Today is the 17th day of January, the year 2015. And according to my calculations, that means we only have 341 shopping days left until Christmas and 16 days left until Groundhog Day. Uh, thankfully, well, even though it's only 16 days left of Groundhog Day, those of us on the staff of North Star Oasis, and if you would have seen our show last week, we kind of thought Groundhog Day came a little bit early, that it should have really been last week. But hey, I am enjoying these warmer temperatures. Uh, bring on climate change, bring on global warming. Uh, it's the middle of winter, and we're enjoying the 38 degree temperatures. But uh, what we're not necessarily enjoying is the tinkering of state government into the affairs and the pocketbooks of people in this area. Uh, I'm going to, before I really get into the subject of today's show, I want to bring up the fact that one of the goals of North Star Oasis is to have an ongoing discussion about the items that are pertinent to people in our viewing, uh, our viewing audience which means that some days we have information sessions like today and other days we kind of tie everything together like we did last week. And like I said last week, I mean, if you haven't been on to our YouTube channel, go to youtube.com slash northstaroasis and check out our show from last week because the things that we've been discussing for six weeks all kind of came together at a head last week in one one-hour episode and it, it blew the minds off of everybody on our staff. Just the fact that it all tied together. I also want to remind you that since we are broadcasting live on suburban community channels, we are also simulcast on other uh, cable stations throughout the St. Paul area, and we are on Twitter. Go to twitter.com at North Star Oasis and join in the discussion there. Twelve years ago, I was a student at the Defense Information School at Fort Meade, Maryland took a course in, uh, it, was a, it was two courses kind of packaged together. I first had a supervisor's course and then a couple of days off and then I went in for a longer editor's course in public affairs. And when I'm in Fort Meade, Maryland, I'm in part of the metropolitan uh, D.C. area and it reminded me just before I left, I left on March 19, uh, 2003 to come home, that I had been involved in a group, uh, an internet group, Facebook wasn't around then, that focused on rail issues. And it was called All Aboard. It was part of the Yahoo Groups network. And we brought in people who were rail fans from all different spectrums. Uh, we had people who were industry insiders. We had people from class one freight railroads. We had people who were employees at Amtrak. We had your uh, rail fans who take the cameras out and photograph uh, passing trains, and we had rail historians such as myself. All of us came together, but there was a, a griping session for a number of weeks in the uh, middle of 2000. It is this, this long, ongoing discussion. And that discussion centered around what Amtrak was doing wrong. And every single time we turn around, there's somebody bashing Amtrak, but nobody was offering any type of solutions. And so I finally, I and a couple of others, we kind of had enough. We had enough of the griping. And if you've ever been in any type of internet chat room, you know what I mean. There's somebody who's always negative, always picking things apart, never offering any solutions, and it just drives everybody else in that group crazy. And that's what was happening here. What, and was, this wasn't centered up one person. And so finally, I and a couple of other people started posting, hey, what can you do to improve? And what, what would be some suggestions that you would offer if you were in control and you had some power to facilitate change? And then slowly but surely we started getting some feedback and the three of us decided that we were going to put together a formal proposal and submit it to Amtrak of pretty much saying, hey, this is some people who come from all different backgrounds and we know what's wrong with your railroad and here is a list of things that you can do to improve upon it. Uh, again, coming from a lot of people who worked at Amtrak and worked at some of the other railroads. So uh, it's not like a bunch of people who sitting around uh, a room having a couple beers and making things up. No, this, these were industry professionals. I just happened to have been the conduit to which everybody passed their information. And so uh, 
after I finished this course, I went back to my old notes and I typed up the formal proposal, emailed it over to the other two people, got their uh, last minute feedback, and then the day I left Fort Meade, I went to Kinko's, and it was one of the last things I did before driving home. Got, in the, got over to Kinko's, printed everything off, because my computer was already packed away, and then made a nice cover, had it bound, put it in an envelope, drove down to Washington, D.C., and dropped it off at Amtrak headquarters for David Gunn, the president of Amtrak. So President Gunn got our proposal. A few weeks later, I got a letter back thanking him for the proposal, and slowly but surely you started seeing some of the changes into the Northeast Corridor that we had put together on our little uh, industry study task force were actually being implemented and changes being facilitated positively. And I'm not going to say that you know our little working group had all of the answers to what happened with Amtrak, but the fact is it doesn't take a lot of people to facilitate some form of change. But it does take a couple of people to actually have the wherewithal to say, hey, we're going to do that. And we've got people here who are, are thinking about things. And, and I'm, I'm starting this program with Amtrak not because I want to spend the whole hour discussing Amtrak, because there was another thing that was also being discussed at that point in time, and that was light rail transit. We had a lot of light rail transit initiatives that were being planned and developed at that point in time. And that also included here. We just had the approval for the Hiawatha light rail, and the central corridor was still on the drawing books. And there were a few interesting items that came out of that. And so in 2005, I had the opportunity to have a discussion with Dan Bell, who was the chair of the Metropolitan Council. And I also had a similar conversation with Rafael Ortega from Ramsey County. He was the, rail rep uh, the rep Ramsey County representative to the rail board. And I said, guys, I know you guys want rail, but here, here's another alternative. And it does not take a governmental group to initiate good plans. But the problem was the governmental group had already settled upon their plans. Their plan is what we're seeing playing out right now. We're seeing the ground-based light rail transit system. We're seeing more of an emphasis on the development in the community, less of an emphasis on moving people, which is the point of transit. The proposal that I had came out of the Aero Rail Development Corporation, which is based in Texas, and their transit plan dealt with elevated rail going on T-beams so you, you could run these trains overhead. You, you don't have to actually buy the rights of way on the ground or you don't have to dig up all, of, you know, in this case, Hennep uh, I mean, uh, University Avenue. You don't have to dig up University Avenue. You can put a T-beam, uh, you know, centered every so many feet and you can run elevated rail right over the city street. And it would have been cheaper to actually do because you're not dealing with land acquisition costs. You're not dealing with uh, the removal of utilities. You're not dealing with the additional construction uh, costs that go with tearing up roadway and, and rebuilding. You're not uh, subjecting the traffic flow to have to be completely rerouted. There were a lot of benefits to Aerorail. And with both Dan Bell and Raphael Ortega, I gave them a pitch. I showed them the video. It would have been much more cost effective. And they both just kind of ignored me and went on their own merry way. And now we have a completely messed up system on University Avenue. It's not to say that I have exactly all the answers. I'm not going to be that boastful. But it's the failure of government to really consider alternative sources or alternative ways of doing what they're trying to accomplish the goal that they've set before them. That is what the problem is. When you have government officials who just don't want to listen because they think that they know better for you than what you know better. And mind you, look at with Amtrak, 
you know, I had industry professionals, I was just a conduit, pass the information on to the president of Amtrak who actually acted upon some of those initiatives. You look at Met Council in Ramsey County, I had through some of these very same real professionals, alternatives to accomplish the goal that were, would have been uh, better suited for the customer, the, tra the transit riders, it would have been more cost efficient for the taxpayer, and it would have still provided for growth opportunities, which is kind of the goal of what we now call as uh, the Met Council's Thrive 2020. And they didn't listen. So now here we are again. We've got the we've got the green line or the the blue line which used to be the Hiawatha line that's operational we have the green line which used to be known as the central corridor that's operational we keep hearing about all these ridership statistics but ridership statistics do not does not equal revenue at the fare box and the simple reason is that they keep giving rides away uh, how are you going to keep this thing functional and affordable if you keep giving your rides away. I, I, I go to sporting events. If you go to a Vikings game, a Twins game, a Timberwolves game, a Lynx game, a Swarm game, or a, a Minnesota Wild game, they always have Metro Transit doing their in-stadium advertising say, that essentially states, same ad repackage, you, if you have a ticket to the game, you can ride the Metro Transit buses and trains for free two hours before and two hours after the game. And they bring on the mascots and all that, you know, to kind of you know, rev up the crowd. But the fact is, if you look at how many tens or hundreds of thousands of people, actually hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people go to stadiums to visit sporting events each year here in the Twin Cities metropolitan area, even if you take 10% of them and you give them rides, we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars that could actually be used to pay for that rail, to ease the burden on taxpayers. But no, we give away the product. And now they're looking at expanding that light rail system even further. A lot of stuff in the news lately about the Southwest light rail transit uh, going to, from Minneapolis to some of the western suburbs. And now we're discussing the uh, Rush Corridor, which would essentially go from St. Paul up to Hinckley, through our neighborhood, St. Paul, Maplewood, North St. Paul, uh, White Bear Lake, Hugo, up to Forest Lake. So now we're going to play you a, a segment of video here that occurred last week. And it's of a town hall meeting for the Rush Line Corridor. We're going to hear just a couple of moments of... Uh, County Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt, and then after that we have uh, the person is Dan Myers. He is giving the actual formal presentation on the Rush Line Corridor. The biggest thing is that they're in Tier 1 of their planning right now, and they're trying to seek public input. The question I have for Mr. Myers and I have for Commissioner Reinhardt is, if you get answers and some viable proposals that you do not wish to hear, will you still act upon them in a forthright manner? Rafael Ortega didn't. Dan Bell didn't. Are you guys going to be any different? Let's watch the video. Um, the routes are over here. There's a lot of information here. And I guess I will end with the fact that it is also, we're taking this information, a lot of it's on the website right now. But as we uh, get the input, we make sure that we summarize that and get that onto the website as well. So uh, again, the transparency and trying to make sure that we get as much input as possible is what we're here for tonight. And I just want to say thank you for being here. A great turnout. And it has been a great turnout at both of the previous open houses as well. Again, bear in mind, this is not by any means the only place to provide that input. This is just one of the other settings that we have to get input. So thank you and enjoy the evening and um, you know all the folks that are on the task force and on the policy advisory committee are available to um, you know by contacting us through the website if you have specific questions for us. Thank you. Okay, I'll um, I will start and uh, like uh, Commissioner Reinhardt said, she's giving me 15 minutes to talk here. 
Um, and this, like, like uh, Commissioner Reinhardt says, this is our first time we, this is our actual third night, Tuesday night, we're up in Hugo at the City Hall. Last night we are in St. Paul at the uh, Duluth Case Rec Center, and tonight we're here, and we're going to be coming back in June with some more information, uh, and I'll be going over that uh, momentarily. So really why are we here tonight is really to get you up to speed on the project, what we've been doing since we last uh, had open houses in May at the end of May of last year. We've been doing a lot of uh, work on, on the project, and most of that it has to deal with what are the needs in the core, what is, what is the purpose of the, of the project that we're trying to build here or look at. Uh, and then really, the last bullet is listening to you. We really want to listen to you, and that's why after this presentation, we'd like to talk to you one-on-one -on -one in groups. I think we've already been doing that a lot already, um, but we continue to do, we'll continue to do that to at least seven, and if you want to stay later, we can uh, try to stay later as well in two. So to start with, this, uh, this map kind of shows where we started with. In 2008 and 2009, uh, Ramsey County Regional Railroad Authority completed a, uh, an alternatives analysis. And the two lines that came out of that, out of about tw 10 to 12 different alternatives that we looked at that made, made the most sense, was the blue line, which is from Union Depot, up 35E to 35 to Forest Lake, a more of a BRT or a bus rapid transit uh, uh, mode, transit mode. The other from Union Depot, the yellow line, uh, is uh, goes up the uh, the uh, uh, Ramsey County right-of-way, um, or the Bruce Vento Trail, um, and it's in, in White Bear Lake. So this is what we started with, um, because that was what was came out in 2009. That's what we brought in May to you. So we've been doing a lot of work since that time after listening to everybody in May at those open houses, as well as throughout the whole engagement process. So where we're at right now in this sort of gumball machine of a funnel is we're, we're going to be doing an alter, uh, some evaluation uh, on three tiers. The first one that we're, and this is really what we're doing tonight, is we have a universe of alternatives for alignments or roadways or trails that uh, a, a, a transit investment can be on, and also different looking at different modes. So over the next couple months, and coming back to you in June, we're going to be looking at what makes the most sense and what should be almost on a pass fail. Does it pass? Does it should it continue on at a real qualitative level, or do we uh, or do we just fail it and, and, and set it aside? Then, starting in June, after we come back out, we'll be starting to do the second tier, a detailed evaluation, really getting into those questions that you have right now. How much is it going to cost to build it? How much is going to operate it? How much is going to? How, who's going to be funding it? Uh, how many people are going to be riding it? Where are the station's going to be? What sort of economic development is going to be there? Where whose houses are going to be impacted? What businesses are going to be impacted? So that's what we'll be doing there. And then at the end, when we hit uh, probably the end of this year, around between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we will be refining what we call a locally preferred alternative, and it truly is a local pre pre uh, alternative. We, that's why we're here tonight to listen to you. The whole implementation process. So right now. We are right in this area here, and usually this takes about two to three years to do this pre-project development. Really what we're trying to do is do detailed analysis, initiate environmental studies, and then really identify that alternative. The next step, if, if we have an alternative, is really to look at that project development. Is moving it forward into project development, doing a true environmental review, adopting, further adopting uh, the alternative, then engineering, then construction. So from this point, which we began in 2014, until uh, until possible construction and operation, you're looking at somewhere between about 10 to 12 years uh, to do that. So what we've done uh, so far, these are from the time that we started the project in April of last year until today. All the different uh, meetings and community events and presentations and pop-up displays and mini open houses. And so now we're into our second round of open houses now. And I think what's more important is we've done a lot of work here locally in Maplewood and St. Paul and even in the, going up into White Bear Lake. We've uh, done walking tours of the of the trail. I think two or two or three walking tours of the trail. We've gone to different market fests up in White Bear Lake. We've gone to the White Bear Avenue uh, parade. We've, we've really tried to reach out at a real local level. And really, these are the other things that uh, Commissioner Reinhardt had mentioned that she doesn't know much about. The, the website, the tweeting, the, the uh, other social media and everything, but there's different ways of trying to, to get on to, uh, to get information. I think the email is an important one, so if you, if you have an email, 
definitely give us that and we can get you information about what we're doing and when we're gonna be in your neighborhood and the next open houses and everything like that. Additionally, we, we can also uh, uh, text you when, when these open houses are occurring too. If you, if you have a cell phone and can accept text, we can do that. So there's many ways of trying to get involved. So uh, to kind of talk about the work that we've been doing from uh, starting in June of last year until now and really trying to find out what the purpose of the project is and really trying to dig down into that. And really the overall purpose is to provide transit service that satisfies the long-term regional mobility and accessibility needs for business and the traveling public. And that long-term really is out to about 2040. We're really looking at not just in five years, not just in 10, but really looking long-term out into that. And then finally also is catalyzing sustainable development within this study area, within the corridor that you've been looking at the, at the maps there then too. So further on with that, we take that, perf that project purpose and we say, so what are the needs? Why, why are we doing this? You know, what, what really is, is impacting for, to make an investment in transit or, 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 or something within, in this corridor? And there's really four major project needs. I'll go through those one at a time. The first need is sustainable growth and development. And all these graphics and everything are all in the back of the room. So if you wanted to spend more time in looking at them, you could or ask us questions. From 2010 to 2040, population is uh, forecasted to grow just in this corridor by 24%. So from about 445,000 to 555,000 people. So there's a lot of growth that's gonna be incurring that. And this, this, this data comes from the Metropolitan Council and from uh, the US, uh, US Census. Additionally, employment is increasing. As you can see, about 30% increase in employment in this corridor as well in that 30 year time frame uh, that we're trying to, we're, we're looking at. Additionally, that, that population and employment growth will occur in different portions of the court. And you can kind of see the, municip the, municip the municipalities, <coughs> St. Paul, Hugo, Forest Lake, all have major uh, changes in population in the plus range. So in population in, in St. Paul, you're looking at about a 50,000 person. Hugo, expecting a lot of growth in there as it, uh, as it grows towards Forest Lake, and then in Forest Lake as well. And then on the, uh, on the right-hand side, the employment side, a lot of jobs coming to St. Paul. This is all forecasted in the next 30 years by the Metropolitan Council as well. The need number two is people who rely upon transit. So uh, as, we, as, as the population uh, grows older with the baby boom now uh, retiring and even then with the, the newer uh, members of society with the millennials, they call them, not really wanting to, uh, to have a car. They would rather ride transit or bike or walk. In the last 12 years, and just in this quarter, there was an increase of, uh, of the elderly population by 1,300 people. Additionally, poverty uh, in the quarter uh, up from uh, over those 12 years by 55% in, 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 the, in the whole quarter. The number of people with, uh, with accessibility to cars continues to grow where they don't have a car, they don't have that accessibility, so they really are transit captive to, or, or getting, you know, uh, walking or, or taking transit to that. And then also the median household income declined in the quarter by about 11%. So there's really needs for people who really need to, uh, to uh, use, uh, use transit. Need number three is the, uh, the limitations of sustainable travel options in the quarter. You can kind of see the, um, the, uh, the cars on the, on the upper half uh, represent what's on Highway 61. And on the lower half is what's on I-35E. There's uh, traffic volumes in this area are increasing from uh, 1998 to 2012 on Highway 61. You see a 9% growth just on Highway 61. And similarly on, uh, on uh, 35E, it goes from about 2 million cars per day to about 2.1 million cars per day, about, about 100,000 uh, growth in there or 3%. Also, the corridor area commute times on the, on the right-hand side are, is actually, you see the, the negative number at the bottom, that's for the, uh, the zero to 20 minute commute times. Now you're really looking at, in between 2000 and 2012, a 17% increase on there then too. And lastly, there is increasing demand for transit in the corridor. As you can see in, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, in downtown St. Paul, going northbound, there's about a 10% increase in demand for northern-oriented routes, whether that's uh, going up to Maplewood, to White Bear Lake, to Hugo, to, uh, to uh, Forest Lake as well. A little less going on the west side, a negative 3%, and 4% uh, going east and south. 
And then finally on the right, there is an increase in demand for express and suburban local routes. So this all kind of builds up, all this data really builds up to what are we trying to put into this corridor? What's important and what are the needs uh, in order to uh, build a, a, a transit investment that meets those needs? And if, I, if anybody can't hear me, please let me know and I'll continue to try to talk loud. So what comes out of that is really project goals that are support at the development and evaluation of alternatives. So we took these, the, what we saw as the needs and we started to develop these different alternatives, these alignments that you see on the maps here tonight. So this is really what we're, what we're looking at. It also, we also looked at what the public was telling us and saying, hey, you really need to look at Highway 61 or White Bear Avenue or Payne or, or whatever it might be. And then really based on the defined pro per, uh, project uh, purpose and need, we now know what, what kind of investment that we have. What are specific goals are we trying to improve for that investment? So what we did is, along the top there, you can see the four needs that we just spoke about, the, those project needs, and we have project goals and how they relate to each of those needs. So the first one, I'll just briefly go through this, is really we need to increase the use of transit and its efficiency to attract all users, whether it's somebody who lives in Forest Lake and only wants to take an express bus to downtown, in the morning and then come back in the afternoon, uh, in the evening to, to go home. And, and for those that are using the uh, <coughs> bus all day long to take the shopping, to, to work, to school, or whatever it might be. We also need to improve sustainable travel options between and within the study area communities. So looking at those different <coughs> options, not just about cars, uh, but also looking at bikes and ped pedestrians and, and, and transit as well, too. Enhancing the connectivity of the port of the regional transportation network. So looking at the green line that's now operating, looking at the gold line out to Woodbury that's uh, now under study uh, with, a, with an environmental impact statement. So connecting that, and then so those are the major lines, and then also looking as you go north, how do you connect to the rest of the transit system in the region as well, too? The, set, the, uh, the fourth is uh, supporting sustainable growth and development patterns that reflect the vision of the local community. So the local communities, all the way from St. Paul, all the way north to Forest Lake, they've done a lot of work on what they want their land use plans and their vision to be. So we want to reflect whatever we build to, to those policies and plans, that have sustainable plans. And that includes the Metropolitan Council as well, who, who is now uh, has their Thrive uh, uh, 2040 uh, plan as well. Contributing to the improving regional equity and sustainability and quality of life, looking at ways of not uh, not all, only about uh, travel in a car, but looking at all different modes as well into. And then finally, I think one of the most important ones, and that's why we're here tonight, is really developing and selecting an implementable and most importantly, a community-supported uh, project or projects as we move forward. So these evaluations of alternatives, I kind of went through this on that. Uh, uh, gumball uh, funnel is really the tier one. We're looking at transit mode and alignment separately. So that's what we're really doing tonight. We have, that's why we kind of separated the modes over there and the alignments over there. We're looking at them and we're going to be looking at them quali in a qualitative and some quantitative sense and trying to say, okay, over the next couple months, what makes sense to set aside and what makes sense to keep moving forward to the tier two where we get much more quantitative focus and we start to pair together the, the mode and the alignment. So say like on, I'll just use an example of Highway 61. What could fit, if we have Highway 61 as a alignment, what sort of mode could fit on there and how would it be impacting that on Highway 61 or White Bear or the trail or whatever it might be. And then tier three, which is that last thing that we do, we refine the alternative, make sure that it's um, uh, very cost effective to build and, and, and do it that way. You know, what could come out of it, a locally preferred alternative, is just improve the bus system that's out there right now, or it could mean, you know, building a, a light rail or a, a bus rapid transit as well. So those are all on the table right now, and that's why on the mode map we have local bus uh, as one of the modes. So we look at here, this is the, these are the transit modes that we're going to be looking at. Uh, they are either rubber tired with the local bus, the arterial rapid transit, similar to what's being built on Snelling Avenue in St. Paul right now. Um, they call it the A-Line, that's being, uh, that'll be, uh, be running by the uh, end of this year. Uh, also looking at bus, bus rapid transit on the freeway as well, uh, on, on I-35B. And then really three uh, uh, rail modes, and you can kind of see the, what they look like 
in sort of uh, in, in scale by over there uh, at the at the mode table. We're looking at streetcar. We're looking at light rail that everybody uh, has, knows about. Uh, that op is now operating on the green line between uh, the cities. And then diesel multiple units, a little bit longer vehicle, but it's being utilized a lot now in other parts of the country then too. So these are the potential transit modes that we're going to be looking at during this tier one. And then also the other potential alignments, the potential alignments for tier one is basically the purple lines and then the blue lines. And you can, I think a lot of people have been seeing that over on the table behind here and then over here. The blue lines represent what we brought out to you in May of last year at the open houses. This was what came out of our 2009 study that made sense. So since then, we've been listening to everybody. We took stuff that we, uh, items that we heard from, uh, from, the, uh, from the open houses. We also um, talked about, uh, you know, what we, uh, what we heard at all the uh, other things, the pop-up meetings, the community events that we've been doing. So we've added this all in there. And you can kind of see from the top, the blue line, as I said, the 2009 study, the public engagement. And then we also have, for that sort of regional connectivity, the green line as it comes down University Avenue and, and, and heads towards the Union Depot. And also the, the, the gold line, which is coming from uh, Woodbury area, that's bus rapid transit being studied right now. And that goes right to the Union. So this is what we're looking at, the universe of alternatives at this point. Next steps, we're here to listen to you tonight. We'd love to talk to you. Anybody with, like uh, Commissioner Reinhardt had mentioned, anybody with a, a name tag would be able to, to, to answer any questions. And, um, and then also, if you, you could, we'd really like you to fill out the comment sheets. If you, got, if you did not get that, make sure you get a copy of it and, and you can fill it out tonight. And I think as soon as we're done here, I'm going to raise this and you can see the comment box over. You'll see in a moment behind the, behind the screen. Um, like I mentioned, the next open house, we're not sure what the date yet, but in June we'll be coming out again. It might be in the same different areas. We've been really trying to have different, uh, different venues as well. And then finally, what we're going to be looking at that is the results of that tier one alternative analysis. So I really look forward to, we all look forward to talking to you a little bit more one-on-one uh, -on -one or in groups um, around the table at the different boards. If you have questions, feel free to, to ask anybody with a name tag. Well, that was the presentation from the town hall meeting. Uh, a couple things, just when I had watched the video, I was unable to make it actually to the town hall meeting that night. Otherwise, I would have been there. Uh, two to three years pre-project development as one of the early things that uh, Mr. Myers had stated. And, and the other is that uh, Commissioner Reinhardt stated that, well, we're early in the process. But yet, one of the first slides is that, well, this has kind of been going on since 2008 or 2009. So we've really been eight years at it or seven years at it, but we're really early in this process. Um, that doesn't exactly make complete sense. Um, Although I think what it is is that we've been thinking about it, we've been wanting to do this, but only now in this last year, year and a half, have we actually been able to execute because we had Southwest Light Rail and Central Corridor took up the priorities and it's finally now the rush line is on the higher priority list. Plus uh, there are also other uh, political fortunes that have uh, changed as certain people who are now no longer representing their counties on the board and other people who are more rush line friendly are so they now know they now believe that they can actually get this passed through uh, and of course this is an attempt to be transparent as possible and corny from Commissioner Reinert and we want to get your input we want to reach out in any way we can with your concerns solutions but are they really wanting that or is this just a matter of we got to go through the motions in order to get what we want because we already know what we want and no matter amount of convincing is going to change our minds. Let's just take a quick look here now is what is operating in that system. You have the Metro Blue Line which used to be the Hiawatha Light Rail System. Uh, going from the, mini from the Mall of America through the airport area, the VA hospital, uh, and up to downtown Minneapolis. Then you have the Green Line, which connects the two downtowns, St. Paul and Minneapolis. You have the Metro Red Line, it's Cedar Avenue Rapid Bus Transit. And then you have the North Star Commuter Rail, which goes from uh, Big Lake down to Minneapolis. Uh, 
In process is the A line, which is uh, Snelling Avenue uh, bus rapid transit. Uh, then you have a blue line expansion and a green line expansion. Uh, the green line expansion essentially is being the Southwest Corridor Light Rail, which is probably not going. There's probably enough opposition to it now, and enough cost overruns to it that even Governor Dayton is starting to say, "Hey, it looks like we may not get this." Uh, now is planned, and I'm going right off the Metro Council website, uh, MetroCouncil.org. Uh, under the transportation projects. Planned is the Metro Orange Line, 35W Bus Rapid Transit, the Gateway Corridor, Midtown Corridor, Red Rock Corridor, Robert Street Corridor, and the Rush Line Corridor. So essentially they still have one, two, three, four, five, six more, well five, um, most likely five light rail systems and a rapid bus transit planned. And then they've got two light rail and one rapid bus transit that are in progress. And if you figure out that each light rail system costs approximately $1 billion of taxpayer money between Fed and state and local taxes in order to, to just get constructed, this does not include the operational expenses. We're spending a lot of money and yet we're just giving away these rides. And is that really, really what we want to do? Now, I'm going to look at what Mr. Myers had to state. You know, he had um, the first thing that he had in his four areas of why we are doing this is sustainable growth and development. Sustainable growth and development. We are not doing this to move people from point A to point B in a rapid manner. I hear from, from uh, the light rail proponents all the time on how much, oh, this is going to take cars off the road, this is going to be a way of uh, being able to save the environment, but what they're really looking at is sustainable growth and development. That is the entire mechanism of the Met Council's Thrive 2020 program. It has nothing to do with transit. It has everything to do with erasing the city borders, erasing the geographical borders to allow people to spread. For many years we've heard from uh, one group about how we're all against urban sprawl. Now they're promoting, uh, well now what they're trying to do is promote urban sprawl. Um, I probably just said the same thing. <laughs> uh, okay, what I meant to say is they're, all, they're all criticizing urban sprawl, people moving out of the urban areas into the suburban areas, but what they're now trying to do is increase the urban areas. They're trying to make Maplewood and North St. Paul a part of the city of St. Paul. They're trying to expand that all the way up to White Bear Lake. They want to make sure that, you know, Minneapolis is connected with Maplewood, but Really, what they're trying to do is just make one big metropolitan area of urban development. That's all it is. We're going to build a rail system, and then we're going to build all affordable housing. Well, affordable housing, as we know, is not really affordable for the people who need to live there. It's affordable for the developers who put money in and get a whole lot more money out and profit when they sell, when they sell everything. But it's not to help the people. It's to help a select few line their pockets. That's really what it's all about. It's about controlling the population and along their corridors, and that's why they're called corridors. We're going to have this corridor and that corridor. Yes, it's a corridor of moving people into these, co uh, these corridors. In the meantime, those of us who are in the suburbs or in the exurbs or who are out in the greater part of the state are paying for all of this, but what are we getting for it? We're getting, oh, free rides on Metro Transit throughout our system because we want to get you used to riding the trains. We want you to get used to riding the buses. But now what about those who are currently riding the buses? Uh, when I was a young college student 25 years ago, I was on Metro Transit all the time. I hated having to go to the downtowns to get to the other suburbs. If I wanted to go from Maplewood to Roseville, I would have to take a bus from Maplewood, get down to the city of St. Paul, and then take another bus over to um, Snelling Avenue, and yet another bus to go up to Rosedale, instead of actually having something that would connect the Maplewood Mall to the Rosedale Mall. You go to the University of Minnesota. You go from, say, North St. Paul. You have to take a bus throughout North St. Paul to get to downtown to get onto another bus to get you into downtown Minneapolis. Uh, and this is the short way, 20-something years ago. And then on there, you get another bus. It takes you two hours to get from North St. Paul over to Minneapolis by bus and 20 minutes by car.
There is a need for transit. And thankfully, Mr. Myers did mention that we got to take a look and see if perhaps uh, we can... Uh, we can improve on the transit system as being an option. And yes, I think that should be the most viable option right now. Uh, rail is too expensive and not user friendly. Now, I want to take a close look right here. Uh, I'm going to show a video, uh, something that came up last summer. Um, this was, uh, and so mind you, this was last summer. It's a poll. Uh, and it's, um, so when you see 74 degrees on the bottom, it's going to be you know, from August, not from uh, January. The Twin Cities' newest light rail opens tomorrow. There will be plenty of celebrating, complete with music and politicians. But as political reporter Tom Hauser tells us, our new KSTP Survey USA poll shows many Minnesotans won't be celebrating. After months of testing light rail trains on the new Green Line, the $957 million link between Minneapolis and St. Paul opens to the public Saturday. But it won't be fully embraced by most Minnesotans, according to our KSTP Survey USA poll. 51% of Minnesotans say it's not worth the money. 40% say it is worth it. 10% aren't sure. This poll suggests that there's not a groundswell of support even now for light rail. Larry Jacobs of the University of Minnesota Humphrey Institute says light rail has been a tough sell from the start. The Hiawatha line was controversial, as is the Green Line along University Avenue. Our poll asked Twin Cities residents how often they plan to use the new light rail line. 65% say almost never, 28% occasionally, 6% regularly. What we're creating here, Tom, is the 21st century transit system. And with the introduction of the Green Line tomorrow, we're doubling our Metro light rail capacity. Metro Transit Deputy General Manager Mark Furman told me in a radio interview that support will grow as light rail lines reach more people. But most callers to the radio show echoed what we found in our survey when asked how often they would use the Green Line. On a regular basis, occasionally, or almost never. Almost never. I mean, the bus is so much more flexible than the light rail. Metro Transit is hoping a combination of light rail and buses will provide even more flexibility. In St. Paul, Tom Hauser, 5 Eyewitness News. So... Most people say never or almost never. Reminds me of a situation that popped up last summer, or uh, actually maybe in September, October time frame. A big news story. People who are actually wanting to use the Green Line who park around university, the streets off of University Avenue, they would get ticketed for parking there. Wait a minute. You're ticketing people who want to use your system. You're not providing places for them to park off of the line so if you want to go to say Snelling Avenue and you don't have any place to park you got to find a place to park because you want to park at Snelling and then take the train that they want you to ride even if it's a if it's a free ride that you want you know you're a ridership statistic and they're going to ticket you for parking too close to their rail line that does not make sense and yes I still believe it's part of a larger hidden agenda. I want to quickly uh, look at uh, the poverty stats. Section number two on that presentation uh, was people who rely on transit. He mentions a 55 percent increase in poverty and with an 11 percent decline in disposable income of people who live along the corridor. 55 percent increase in poverty. It would seem to me that instead of just saying well we're gonna we're gonna have an increase in poverty well then maybe we ought to fix the poverty issue first Instead of just saying, well, we know we're going to have more people in poverty, so we're going to make sure that they can get to work. Well, no, it makes more sense to fix the poverty. It makes more sense to fix that 11% decline in disposable income. The focus is completely backwards. The focus is not where it should be. If we really want to help people, which I really do believe that there are some good-hearted people in government who really do want to help people and who do believe that a light rail will fix those problems and will help these people, fact is... By you taking out of Peter to pay Paul, this is a redistributionist model, and they're just using the guise of transportation to accomplish that objective. Yeah, why are we going to have a 55 percent increase in people in poverty in this area? Well, government's already dictated that. They've already told us. And then 
this, they're mentioning sustainable travel options are limited. Well, then points out that out of 2 million people who travel on 35E every day, it's going to go up to 2.1. So that's only 100,000 increase in cars on that along, you know, along the way. 100,000. But look at how messed up the roads are around the Cayuga Bridge right now. They're putting in millions of dollars to fix the roadway there at a major choke point, which is actually the proper function of government. That is a project that has been long needed, and I'm glad to see it's starting to come to fruition. And yet, that should be able to absorb an extra 100,000 cars per day once they actually get that finished, which I believe is supposed to be in like October or November of this year. So we only have one more year, and that, pro that problem is going to be fixed. And that's going to sustain the 100,000 increase. So options three is really not, a, not an issue for what they had brought it out to be. And then four is increasing demand for, tra for transit. If this were true, buses would be packed but they're not. Yeah, a few lines are here and there. There's a few that are really, really jam-packed, a few high demand lines. Okay, let's take a look at, at those high demand lines. But I've seen many buses that go by at all hours of the day that have very few people on them. So that tells me that the bus lines need to respond to this before we start dealing with rail. And then comes the uh, accident situation. And I know that my producer is probably not hearing a word I have to say right now, but I would like him to bring up the computer screen uh, to show the blue and green line accidents. Um, just going to highlight just a couple of them. This is from lrtdoneright.org. Uh, just to scroll down, I'm going to scroll at the bottom. This is just since uh, June 8th of 2007. Read a couple of quick headlines here. Commuter, uh, commuter falls to death between cars at LR, LRT stop in Minneapolis. Uh, November 21st, 2007. Uh, light rail train hits, kills man in Minneapolis. Uh, August 3rd, 2009. Man in Minneapolis, uh, light rail crash dies. And that guy was only 22. Uh, August 13th, 2009, Hiawatha light rail train kills pedestrian. September 7th, 2009, Minneapolis pedestrian hit by Metro Transit train. Uh, September 20th, 2009, light rail train hits car near Star Tribune building. February 20th, 2011, authorities identify man killed by light rail train. August 1st, 2011, light rail hits van making illegal turn. August 3rd, 2011, a white minivan and light rail train collide in downtown. And so this is just in 2007 to 11. Now let's just take a look even in 2000, oh, scrolling through 2013. Uh, oh, I, I love this headline, though. Uh, August 26, 2013, Michelob Golden light rail train crash with AC van. I didn't know Mick Golden was... Uh, I know they may have made a sponsorship, but I didn't actually realize that they've switched from being a brewery into a uh, transportation mechanism. It's just a headline that I'm uh, nitpicking here. Um, Blue Line Rail Crash, trailer of uh, January 30th, uh, so just uh, about a year ago. Uh, got stuck on the tracks at 34th Avenue and Airport Lane at 11.20 a.m. Uh, February 1st of 2014, light rail train hits police car. March 18th, 2014, light rail de derailment planned. Uh, two shot at a light rail station on April 12th, 2014. Light rail train hits car June 2nd, 2014. Light rail crossing gate stuck down June 5th of 2014. Uh, woman killed by light rail uh, June 20th, 2014. And then uh, even more recently, we had a police car that uh, was on the green line that uh, the cop was injured and he made a turn and got hit by a train. And then there was a woman who was walking, and this is on the green line, on the 31st of August, right after the green line was, was new. This is, I think, the first fatality on it uh, as an operational system. And she walked in front of a trail, uh, train and lost her life. There were four crashes on the green line even before the train was operational. So it seems to me that we're paying a billion dollars for something that's hazardous to our health. And I want to take a look at one other video here real quick, and that is from Houston, uh, Texas. And you, this you've got to see because this is really what it looks like we're 
coming out through here. It's supposed to ease congestion. Whisk riders quickly around town. And offer a safe and comfortable riding experience. But the five-year-old metro rail system that snakes through Houston, Texas, has earned an unexpected distinction. It's one of the most accident-prone light rail systems in the United States. The reason? All seven and a half miles of it run on city streets, where confused and impatient drivers can't seem to stay out of its way. In its first two years of operation, the system experiences a crash roughly every 12 days. The majority of the crashes are due to motorist error, including the running of red lights, drivers speeding up and attempting to make left turns in front of the trains, and a failure to look both ways. The city of Houston is considering ways to cut down on accidents. In the meantime, the Metro set a new record for the most accidents in one year, 62. In early 2009, the system experienced its 245th collision since opening in 2004. Well, when we go back to adding more rail onto the system and not doing it right and not doing it for the right reasons, this is going to be us. This is going to be us right here in this viewing area. In the city of St. Paul, it's already starting to happen. We're going to start seeing more of it in the suburbs. We're going to see it on the east side. We're going to see it in Maple. We're going to see it in White Bear Lake. This is going to be us in just a few years. Now, in that presentation, they said that this is a 10 to 12 years to complete the process, which began in April of 2014. So by 2024, this is going to be the way of life in our little bedroom community. This is the way it's going to be. This is, this is the standard. We're going to find that we're going to have more trains carrying fewer people, more free rides, and more train passenger, uh, train vehicle collisions. That is going to be the way of life. Is that what you really want? I said at the beginning of the show that an elevated type of rail, aero rail, would prohibit a lot of car-train interactions. It would be cheaper, to, cheaper for taxpayers in purchasing these, but the biggest thing is it would prohibit the loss of life. Now, I find it funny that a lot of the transit proponents are also people who are against the death penalty. They're saying, well, we need, we, we can't, uh, they want safety for one. Everything, we've got to be safe all the time. Nobody can take any risk. We're for, or we're against the death penalty. We don't want anybody, guilty or innocent, or, or innocent to die. And we may make one mistake and somebody who is an innocent person might be executed for the wrong reasons. In the meantime, we're going to spend billions of taxpayer dollars to put something hazardous to the health of those living in this community. That's what we want. There have got to be other options. And I've mentioned AeroRail. Proper planning. I mean, this area used to be a heavy rail community used to have rail all the time. Now we want to bring rail back, but we're not doing it right. Let's take a uh, last look here at one more video uh, from the Center for the American Experiment on the purpose of the Metropolitan Council. As Kathy described earlier, the council, by its very structure, is not accountable to the people it governs, or even to the people that we elect at the city and county level. The council is not directly elected because we wanted the regi a regional body to be free of narrow so-called parochial interests so they could think broadly for the sake of the entire region. That was the plan, right? As a result, citizens are supposed to look to the governor and legislature for oversight. 
the state level oversight is how we have justified this kind of one-off regionalism. As best we can tell, the Met Council uh, is the only regional government structured the way it's specifically structured here in the United States. Unfortunately, the promise of oversight has failed. Neither the legislature nor a long string of governors has held the council in check. There have been lots of campaign promises made and broken, and many good faith attempts at checking the council have failed. As a result, the council's policies lack credibility with citizens and local elected officials. It is notable that the legislature has declined, we think wisely, to add housing or drinking water as regional systems under its authority. Uh, while the legislature made the council an operator of transit and wastewater system uh, in the mid-1990s, it hasn't added any new systems since 1976. What we see in Thrive is the council attempting to expand its own power into housing as a system without legislative permission. It's cloaking itself in this mantle of the ideals that Minnesotans aspire to, which is equal opportunity to work uh, live and live in a way that leads to a successful, prosperous life. Safe neighborhoods and housing, good schools, affordable transportation, and good jobs to support our families. To be clear, the problem is not Thrive per se. It is the Met Council, or maybe regionalism itself. Thrive is just an advanced symptom of a governance problem. So before we talk about what we would do to solve the Met Council problem, you need to ask, what were we trying to accomplish back in the 1960s when we set this up? And what are we trying to accomplish now? because the governance structure of the Met Council has not changed. Set aside for a moment the clear desirability of regional systems for transit and wastewater treatment. The initial goal was to require local governments to have comprehensive plans. We needed the pipes and the roads to match up at a price we could afford. The goal of comprehensive planning by cities was largely accomplished by the 1980s. And instead of declaring job well done, we kept building on top of an unaccountable Met Council structure. Why do we need a regional body elected or appointed when we already have local, county, and state officials to represent us and more ballot decisions than an informed conscientious citizen can reasonably make. The good news is only the legislature can fix this problem. The bad news is only the legislature <laughs> can fix this problem. <laughs> well, we know that we've got problems. We see what the Metropolitan Council is doing. We see how it's impacting our own neighborhoods. And as I mentioned at the top of the program, I am not opposed to rail. I am not opposed to rail at all. I am just opposed to bad rail. I'm opposed to having a bad system implemented. I'm opposed to having people try to put in light rail transit into the community for the wrong reasons. That's what I'm opposed to. That's also what you should be opposed to because we care about this community. We love our community. We want to see our community thrive and grow, to use their term. Uh, but right now, we're not seeing it with this program. So in June, I'll probably remind you between now and then, June we have another uh, town hall meeting come up as they go into phase two. We hope to be able to see you there. In the meantime, check us out at youtube.com slash North Star Oasis and on Twitter at North Star Oasis. We will see you next week. Thanks for watching.